understand something very important, Mr. Speaker. I worry about how the American families are going to afford this. Their electricity rates have gone up and will continue to go up. If this administration is pushed to have coal-fired power plants closed down, have spent billions of dollars for energy subsidies for companies that have gone belly up, gasoline prices have gone up thousands of dollars for families, unemployment has been above 7 percent for years, hundreds of thousands have been made, put out of work because of the aspects of this health care bill. It's tough for families to say, how am I going to pay for this? How are they going to pay, as they say, for 96 percent more for those who get a new plan, 73 percent more for those keeping their insurance, and up to 413 percent because of some of the age issues and other things going on with that? These are tough concerns for American families. And ones that they're asking us to then say, please, repeal this bill and let us get to something that really works to take care of those issues, to help the uninsured, to help those who are ill, to help put doctors back in charge of people's health care plans. We are deeply concerned about those issues as they go on and quite frankly these costs are going to be ones that people aren't going to be able to afford. I want to now recognize uh, another one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Lance, who also wants to speak about this bill. He's another member of our committee who is deeply dedicated to making sure that he's dealing with uh, affordability of the health care bill. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to speak this evening on this important issue. And in my judgment, uh, the Affordable Care Act was a poor piece of legislation and it was not well thought out. In 2009 and 2010, when the leaders of the then House Democratic majority were rallying support for the President's health care legislation. The American people were told that health insurance premiums for individuals and small businesses would decrease under Obamacare, and that was stated repeatedly. Three years later, we have come to learn that this just is not the case. Internal documents from the nation's largest health insurance companies reveal that the health care laws policies, mandates, taxes, and fees will cause major premium increases for consumers in the individual, the small group, and large group markets. And I think it might be particularly onerous on young people, young people who are just starting out, and this in a time when the economy is not as strong as any of us would like. Many small businesses are already feeling the impact of higher monthly premiums. Just this week, I heard from a small business owner in the district I serve, Susan Schwartz of System Builders in Westfield, Union County, New Jersey. And she is seeing her company rates jump by nearly 40 percent, 40 percent in one year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we must work together to provide much needed relief to the small and large businesses being crushed under this burdensome law. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Murphy, and uh, certainly I uh, commend you for your efforts and the efforts of the Energy and Commerce Committee, in which I am a proud member under your leadership in that committee as one of the subcommittee chairs, the committee as a whole under Mr. Upton's leadership, and really all of us in Congress who believe that this law was poorly designed and will lead to massive increases in premium payments for many of the American people. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just inquire how much time we have remaining. Four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, with that then, Mr. Speaker, I'll wrap up here with a couple comments. First of all, I really want to thank the Energy and Commerce Committee staff for bringing out this important study. We only wish this was the kind of information we had a couple of years ago when members were called upon to blindly support this bill <clears throat> and so many other organizations were called upon to support this bill. These are going to be high costs, and people are going to have to make decisions now <clears throat> about what kind of health care they're going to have. Can they afford it? Will they also see the impact on top of their gasoline prices, utility prices, and, and worries about their jobs? That they're going to be making decisions about do I not have health care now and run the risk of having the IRS come after me to charge me $95? People are going to be making those kind of decisions. That's not what we should be doing. Out of care and concern, for every mother and father and grandparent and child in America to make sure that we work on an affordable health care plan that makes sure people who are ill or have pre-existing conditions are not cut, to make sure that the high-risk pool has money in it to help those who have high risk for health care, 
not use money for other purposes there, and to make sure we're working on prevention and caring for the ill. That is what we should be doing to help make health care affordable, not offering a 96 percent increase for those getting a new plan, up to 73 percent for those uh, keeping their insurance, and up to 413 percent for others. Look, we understand some people are going to see their health insurance rates go down. Many will see them go up. That is part of the frightening thing that affects America's families. And Mr. Speaker, may I also add, I know a number of people have commented here, but I also ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend the remarks and include extraneous material on the topic of my special order. Without objection. With that, Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleagues for speaking tonight. I thank the Energy and Commerce staff for also being part of this uh, tonight. And I thank the American people for continuing to communicate with us to understand we want to make health care affordable, but we think the Affordable Care Act is neither. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The, um, the chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Culberson of Texas for today. Without objection, the request is granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on the topic of my special order. Without objection. Mr. Speaker. I rise today to speak in opposition to H.R. 684 and S. 743, the Marketplace Fairness Act, otherwise known as the Internet Sales Tax, or as I call it, the Interstate Commerce Sales Tax. I'm concerned that this new tax on American consumers passed the Senate too quickly, without enough debate, and has the quiet support of several members here in the House. Unfortunately, many of my colleagues opposed to the bill here in the House have taken a quiet wait-and-see attitude. They don't want to rock the boat, so to speak. Well, it's time to quit being quiet on this issue. The American public deserves a full and open debate on this bill before any legislative action is taken in this body. This evening, my colleagues and I will begin that debate. I'm confident that when members and their constituents grasp the full ramifications of this onerous piece of legislation, they will oppose it as well. Many states in this country are in dire financial straits. They've lavished overly generous pension plans on their state employees and offered tax credits and financial incentives to their favorite businesses. They've promised more than they can deliver while sometimes letting essential services go neglected. State governments bear the responsibility for their financial situations, yet they're looking to the federal government for a bailout. Make no mistake, this internet tax is the bailout they're seeking. Without raising taxes, state governments can expect billions of dollars of Americans' hard-earned money to flow to their treasuries if this bill passes. And how would this happen? By passing a bill that proclaims to impose fairness. Who else is for this bill? Large retailers. They've got lots of representatives up here talking to us. They're on the Internet and they're off the Internet, but they're for this bill. They're weary of competing with small and nimble businesses. And that's natural to want to have economic barriers to entry because it's an economic fact that in the absence of innovation in a market with no barriers to entry, profits go to zero in the long run. But how do we create barriers to entry in the United States? How do we compete? It's through innovation. America is the country of innovation. You can invent something. You could make a new piece of music. You could be nicer to your uh, employees than the other company is. Or you can come up with a new, more efficient way of manufacturing your products. But I suggest to you, Mr. Speaker, that sending representatives to Washington, D.C. to impose financial hardships on your competitors is not the American way. Some have said that this bill is about states' rights, and I'm a strong proponent of states' rights. But this bill does nothing to protect states' rights. In fact, this bill changes the very fabric, the constitutional fabric, of the United States of America by subjecting people and businesses in one state to the taxes and regulations 
of another state. This is unprecedented. For the first time in history, this bill would grant states jurisdictions beyond their physical borders. If this bill passes, we'll have a virtual United States of America, where borders no longer mean anything. Justice Marshall ruled that the power to tax is the power to destroy. And we were reminded last week by the IRS's admission that the power to tax is the power to harass. I urge other members of Congress to consider the dangerous implications of granting individual states authority over individuals in other states. Before my colleagues get into the details of this new tax, I'd like to point out that no one, not a single person, has argued that this bill will help our economy. Even proponents of this bill must concede that it increases taxes on American consumers and adds burdensome regulations to small businesses. That's where this debate will begin and end. This bill is bad for our economy. I now yield to the gentleman from Florida. I thank the gentleman for Kentucky from Kentucky and, and thank you for your leadership on getting out ahead of this and uh, really leading the charge. And you're right, this is not going to be good for the economy. And people will say, oh, it's not really a tax increase because some of these taxes are essentially use taxes that are already due. The fact of the matter is this will hurt consumers because they are going to, in fact, have to pay more. And that is not the recipe for success in a high unemployment, low growth economy, which is what we have now and is what we've had for a number of years. And in terms of the, making consumers pay more in taxes, you know, I for one am sick of politicians in Washington and in state capitals throughout the country putting the interests of government ahead of the interests of the people. Our job is not to extract as much money as possible from our fellow citizens, but it's instead to provide a framework that protects their freedom and liberty and allows them to pursue their dreams. This bill obviously doesn't help do that. In fact, it would hinder it. And it would hinder it by making it more difficult on consumers, but also will make it more difficult on up-and-coming new businesses that do business online. This bill represents taxation without representation. And the reason it does that is because the bill would require online businesses to determine, collect, and remit taxes to states with which they have no physical connection. So if you have a business in Florida that does uh, online sales and you sell to somebody in California, you're going to be responsible for determining California sales tax, collecting it, and then sending it to California. The problem is if you have no physical connection to that state, you have no way to hold tax-happy politicians in states like California accountable for the decisions they make in terms of taxing, spending, and regulation. And I would say also people say that there are local stores who have to pay sales tax. If you sell online to somebody out of state, you're not having to sell the tax. We don't require any stores on a local sale to figure out where the consumer came from and then send the tax over to that state. They simply collect the tax that's due in their state. So the compliance requirements are completely different. Indeed, there are over 9,600 taxing jurisdictions in the United States. This bill specifically permits audits from the other states that have sales tax and from Indian reservations, and we have several hundred federally recognized Indian tribes. So this is going to create a huge compliance burden uh, for our small business. And I just don't think it's good policy to saddle small businesses in Florida with red tape and additional compliance costs. I mean, why on earth would any Floridian want an up-and-coming business to fake a tax audit from a state like California or Illinois? And I would say, as the gentleman from Kentucky pointed out, especially in light of what we're seeing with the malfeasance committed by the IRS out of Washington, D.C. You know, the IRS is at least somewhat accountable to the people, at least in theory, because we can always vote out the administration that oversees the IRS. If you have an out-of-state tax audit, you don't have any political representation, so why would they care about your rights? They're not going to care about your rights. They're going to care about getting their revenue. I just want to say a thing about fairness. People say, well, you know, you have brick and mortar local stores versus these internet businesses, but I would suggest that that distinction is illusory. And the reason why is many companies that do business online are brick and mortar companies. 
I have a business in my district in Ormond Beach, Florida. It's called Coastal Moto. And this is a gentleman that put his entire life savings into this business. They now have grown to have five employees. They make custom wheels for Harley Davidson motorcycles, and they ship them worldwide. But they have employees showing up every day to work there, so they are both brick and mortar and online. So it's essentially brick and click. And I would also just endorse what the gentleman from Kentucky said that the tax would give large companies a competitive advantage because any time you saddle businesses with more compliance costs that will create ba barriers to entry for smaller companies and the big businesses are always able to comply um, more easily and look I want companies of all size to do well you know big businesses if they're doing well God bless them I just don't want to tilt the playing field in favor of them and make it more difficult for new businesses to start and grow the internet is one of the most pro-growth pro-opportunity inventions in all of human history it literally gives anybody the chance to move a product if you have an idea you can go online you can put that out and you can be successful it's much easier with the internet to have a successful business than it was a hundred years ago. You're able to get into the market more cheaply and more affordably. That's not something that we should try to undermine. That's something that we should want to continue to promote. And finally, I would just say, is it fair to burden Florida businesses in order to fund excessive spending in states that suffer from severe fiscal mismanagement? I mean, for example, in California, you have county administrators retiring with a four hundred thousand dollar pension for life and so we're going to put burdens on our companies to be able to send money over there so that they can fund that extravagance and i would also note that a lot of that money uh, goes to funding union dues that end up helping fund political campaigns so why would we want to do that so the bottom line is that the bill is bad for consumers it represents taxation without representation it will stymie small business growth growth and it will create perverse economic incentives. Our political system right now is suffering from an accountability crisis. The last thing we need to do is expand government and add to this problem. And I yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you to the gentleman from Florida. He makes an excellent point on the sales tax audit burden on small businesses. I'd like to give you two examples of companies in my district. These are literally mom and pop shops. One of them, the, uh, the wife is the CFO and the husband runs the company. And in the other one, the father owns the company and the son works there every day. They were both subjected to sales tax audits in one state. Let me tell you how the sales tax audit begins and how it ends. So the way it, it began was with a phone call. And that, for many small businesses, is the worst phone call of their life, of their business lives, because they know what they're going to have to endure. So let me give you the example of this farm store who underwent, that underwent a sales tax audit. He was required to prove that every sales tax exempt sale that he made in the previous years was in fact exempt from sales tax under Kentucky state law. The sales tax auditors will pursue you to the end of the earth if they think there's another dime to be found. So they pursued him with much vigor. He spent weeks looking for records, trying to prove that these were, in fact, sales tax exempt. Because if they were not, he owed the sales tax on all of those sales. How does this kind of audit end? It ends with a white flag. There's no way to prove, there's no way to find every shred of paper for every transaction that you've ever had in the past years. So you finally settle with the sales tax auditors. Can you imagine that? You'd be open to sales tax audit, which I've just described, in 45 different states. Now, maybe it only happens once every 10 years in your state. Maybe that's the average. But on average, you'll get four and a half sales tax audits a year, which brings me to the next small business in my district, where the wife is the CFO. This business was subjected to a sales tax audit and an IRS audit in the same year, in fact, this year. This business owner came to me and said, can you pass a bill that would keep me from having to go through two audits in the same year? I mean, it's just not fair. I've got a state tax audit and a federal audit in the same year. This is killing my business. My wife can't work on anything but these audits. Can you imagine if that business is now subjected to 45 audits in 45 different states? I just can't let this, this individual down. 
And while we're talking about sales tax audits, it's up to the states to decide what's sales tax exempt and what's not. And every state has a different rule. And the only way to enforce these rules and to know if you've complied with, is it for a farm, is it for education, is it for resale, is for the retailer to submit all of those sales records, information, if you will, on the individual that purchased them to the state where the individual lives. This is ripe for corruption just as we saw with the IRS recently. Now they know what music you've downloaded, what movies you've downloaded. Maybe you bought some gun magazines. They're going to know about all of this, and it's just ripe for, for corruption and for exploitation. With this, uh, I'd like to yield to my good friend and, and colleague from the state of Montana. Thanks much to my good friend from Kentucky, Mr. Thomas Massey, for coordinating the special order here tonight. I appreciate it greatly. We're here tonight to share our strong opposition to the so-called Marketplace Fairness Act. This is a bill that mandates small businesses to collect sales tax on behalf of other cities and states when selling products over the Internet. The problem is this bill would fundamentally change how online purchases are taxed and would impose yet another burden on small businesses across the country but especially in places like my home state of Montana. You see, in Montana, we don't have a statewide sales tax. In fact, we often say you know you're a native Montanan if you voted against a sales tax twice. But I will have to say that in my home state, we have a balanced budget requirement. And not only did our state balance its budget this year, we're running a surplus. And we've done that without a sales tax. And Washington should do the same. They should learn how to balance their budget and they don't have to impose a sales tax that's imposed on businesses across this country. But even though we don't have a sales tax, under this legislation, Montana small businesses will be forced to collect sales taxes for up to 9,600 cities and states, none of which would go back to the people of Montana. Let me be clear, this isn't just a bill that hurts no sales tax states like Montana. It hurts small businesses in every state burdening businesses that depend on internet sales with added costs and more paperwork and more regulations. Proponents of this bill say, well, it's about fairness. They say that this bill will help prevent the supposedly widespread practice of showrooming, where customers visit a physical store, but then buy the goods online, where customers uh, can get a better price or avoid paying sales tax. According to proponents of this bill, this showrooming is destroying our brick and mortar businesses. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is not only misleading, it's wrong. As the National Journal reported, a recent Price Waterhouse Cooper survey of 10,000 shoppers found this so-called widespread problem occurred less than 2% of the time. In fact, the survey found that 10 times as many consumers researched products online so they could go buy them at the local brick and mortar shop. Think about that. And we've all had that happen to us. You may go online and, and shop, but you may not want to pay the shipping cost. You may not want to have the time it takes to receive the goods. You may want to be buying that bike for your child. So you go downtown and buy at the brick and mortar store. Furthermore, the study states, and I quote, we also can't emphasize enough that the physical store remains the centerpiece of the purchase journey for many categories. In nine out of 11 categories, in fact, the majority of consumers use physical stores for both researching and purchasing the products they want to buy, end quote. I know that many times I'd rather head downtown to my home of Bozeman, Montana, to talk with folks face to face and purchase a product I've researched online so I can avoid shipping fees and avoiding the wait time. I know a lot of Montanans feel the same way. But then I also have to ask, what is fair about forcing a small business that relies on internet sales to learn the ins and outs of 9,600 different tax jurisdictions or be subjected to tax audits, as a gentleman from Kentucky just mentioned, not just from one state, but from all 46 states that collect sales tax. Imposing these unreasonable standards on online retail sales, but not also on brick and mortar retail sales, is not only unfair, it's unworkable. I've heard from Montana small business owners who are deeply concerned about what this bill means for them and how it will affect their ability to remain profitable. I'm concerned too. I've spent nearly three decades in the private sector. In fact, 
Prior to having served in Congress, the last, elect, last elective office I held was student body president of my high school. So I've come from the business world. I'm, I've been a job creator and somebody who's had to fight through regulations and pay taxes. I know that if you're a small business owner and you're forced to comply with more than 9,000 different tax codes, which by the way, most small business owners readily admit it's next to impossible for any small business to do that, you are not going to be investing in your own business. You're not going to be hiring new employees. You're not going to be growing your product base or promoting innovation. You're now going to be spending more time and more capital dealing with regulations and mandates, more time with lawyers and accountants. We also can't forget the threat that this holds for principles that are foundation of our nation's tax policy, and that is states must not be allowed to extend their taxation and regulatory authorities beyond their borders. The Internet tax would do away with the physical presence standard, which dictates that a state can only require a business to collect a sales tax if it's physically present within its boundaries. Furthermore, the people don't want an online sales tax. A recent survey found that 84% of consumers were opposed to this bill. 75% of small online retailers are opposed. Those numbers send a clear message that the American people are strongly opposed to this proposal. So I would ask my colleagues this. Remember, this is the people's house. We are here to represent our districts and our states and do what is best for them. The problem back in this town in Washington, D.C., is that the big businesses, the big corporation, have lobbyists here to be the voice here on the Hill. We need to be the voice tonight for the small business people who don't have lobbyists here in Washington, D.C. because they can't afford them. Imposing a new tax burden in these precarious economic times is clearly not what our small businesses and consumers need. I know one of the fastest ways to slow down growth and innovation is to tax it and to regulate it. This bill is a $23 billion tax increase coming right out of the pockets of hardworking American families. So let me be clear, the so-called Marketplace Fairness Act is a job-killing tax fight that hurts American small businesses and it hurts American consumers. And I promise I will continue to fight this bad piece of legislation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Thank you. I'd like to remind my colleagues that Mr. Dane represents the great state of Montana, which operates with a lean government and has so far got by without a sales tax. That's the great thing about these United States of America. We have 50 states competing with different models for how to run their governments. This tax, as I call it, the interstate commerce tax, is more about harmonizing tax laws across the United States and taking away the competition between states. Now, my fair state of Kentucky has a sales tax of 6%, but I don't think it's fair that uh, we impose a sales tax on the state of Montana when they've worked very hard not to have one. Their businesses aren't subjected ever to a sales tax audit if they don't have to collect the sales tax. So I think he's uh, too modest in not reminding us that he's coming from the state of Montana that has no sales tax. This, this Marketplace Fairness Act could be called the Offshore Our Online Retailers Act because while as uh, congressmen and senators, we can force the states to collect these taxes. We can't go into other countries and, and force them to collect taxes. So what will happen is a lot of our online retailers will move across the border where they enjoy the advantage of collecting no sales tax and there's no way to reach them and impose that tax upon them. Now some say this is not a new tax. Don't call it a new tax. While others say it's not a tax increase. Don't call this a tax increase. Well, I say, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's a duck. I'm new to Congress, but if at the end of a transaction I have less money in my wallet and the government has the money in their coffers, I call it a tax. Now, some will say, look, consumers already owe this tax. At the end of the year, on April 15th, they are supposed to pay the sales tax that wasn't collected in other states. But you know what? That's just not true. They don't owe a sales tax because states long ago conceded that they don't have any authority to tax an event which occurs outside of their physical borders. They just can't do it uh, without a physical presence. But states resented that they couldn't tax in other states, so they created something called a use tax. And I say the use tax is actually a contrived tax. They know they can't tax an event outside of their borders, so they try to tax an event inside of their borders, which is the use of a product. But it's contrived in the sense that it's only owed if you didn't pay a tax on it somewhere else already. So what kind of a tax is that? 
I'll tell you what it is. It's an uncollectible tax, and the states haven't exerted much effort in collecting that tax. We are not here to become tax collectors for the states. I just want to remind the states that. And then also I want to talk a little bit more about my district. A large portion of my district is rural. We don't have stores to buy everything that we'd like to be able to purchase. A lot of folks go online. A lot of folks who are disabled and can't get to the store go online. This is a regressive tax. This will punish those individuals who have the least mobility because they're online shopping. It also diminishes opportunities for businesses in rural areas by taxing those businesses that weren't taxed before that don't have a ready marketplace immediately in their vicinity. Look, we've heard from big business, we've heard from lobbyists, we've heard from state governments, but there's somebody absent from this debate so far, and it's our constituents. We, I think we need to hear from them. And with that, and to address that issue, I yield to the gentleman from Florida. Well, well I thank the gentleman from Kentucky, and, and I would just add to your comments, you, know, you started by talking about the, the federalism, the ability to kind of choose different tax laws, whatever laws, and this would actually facilitate higher taxes. It's a thumb on the scale in favor of higher taxes because it gives states the wherewithal to tax beyond their borders. And so we should at least be trying to go in the other direction. I mean, I want Florida to be more like Montana, not more like some of the other high-tax states. And so I think that bears repeating. So here are some of the folks who have uh, written in via Twitter uh, with their thoughts. Chris writes in, please tell the House that hashtag Internet tax translates into higher costs for families and consumers. A weak economy cannot afford this. Andrew writes in, this will just be the 21st century version of Smoot Holly. Will the lunacy from D.C. never cease? Jay writes in and says the internet tax is an inappropriate extension of the state's powers. It does not make commerce more fair. Another fellow writes in, says it's a revenue grab, plain and simple, no taxation without representation. Is that vague? Tiffany Lyle says, if you tax the internet, it's like taxing air. We work hard enough to earn what little we have. And then Glenn writes in, remind them of how the Stamp Act went. Uh, and so I have some more, but I will, I will yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky because I know you probably have some more comments as well. Well, those comments bring up a, a very good point, and so do your comments. If this is a finger on the scale for higher taxes, states get to arbitrate and decide what gets taxed in their state. So right now we have exemptions for uh, farm products and, and whatnot, but some, some states tax uh, professional services in the transaction. And of course this bill opens up financial service transactions uh, in one state to consumers in another state. But where does this end? As uh, Senator Baca stated in, on the other chamber, that not just the financial world would be open to taxes on their services, but also possibly attorneys, architects, engineers, and accountants. One can only imagine, by not asking the states to do anything to simplify their system in return for the benefit of having out-of-state business collect taxes for them, we're giving them carte blanche to the states to impose even more taxes on business. And uh, again, I think I'd like to hear a few more comments from our constituents. Yeah, we, we do have some more. Uh, Corey writes in, I feel it may hinder an online business I've just started. I'm already, it's already making business pay. Mark says that hashtag internet tax won't help local stores, but will protect online incumbents from new competition. Taylor Newhouse writes in and says, I like the hashtag internet tax about as much as I like getting teeth pulled. We have another fellow writes in, says, it hurts small businesses and it's basically Walmart versus Amazon with consumers in the middle. And then finally, I think this is a, a, great, a great comment from Ian Stumpf, an and internet tax will hurt one of the few remaining healthy sectors of the economy, hashtag disastrous. And I yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you to the gentleman from Florida for sharing that with us. I think all too often we don't hear uh, or listen as much to our constituents as we should. And on this issue, it's very important because those are, in fact, the people who are going to bear the burden of this new tax. And I will call it a new tax. It's unprecedented um, in our Constitution and in the history of this country. 
I'm going to end this discussion tonight the way it began and the way I said it would end and the way it, it would end. No single individual who's a proponent of this tax has told me that it's going to help the economy. In fact, when I point out that it will increase taxes on consumers, when it will increase burden on small businesses, and when it will apply pressure to offshore our online retailers, they all ultimately concede those points. This is not good for our country. The resistance to this bill comes from our constituents, and it's also uh, bipartisan as well. So uh, hopefully by bringing light to this today, we will uh, begin the conversation, begin the debate that all too often doesn't happen out in the open and shed some light on this issue. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Un the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, for 30 minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, do we live in a banana republic? We living under a tin horn dictatorship? I mean, just recently, well, just this evening, the IRS uh, acting uh, chief, Steve Miller, resigned. And I suppose that's damage control. That's, that's how we're going to fix this. You know, heads are going to roll. You know, uh, just recently, Mr. Miller wrote to members of Congress at least twice to explain the process of re reviewing applications for tax-exempt status without disclosing that Tea Party groups had been targeted. So it's nothing new. As a matter of fact, in July of last year, he testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, Oversight Subcommittee, and didn't mention it. He didn't mention the additional scrutiny. I'm sure it must have slipped his mind. Oh, that's right. It couldn't have slipped his mind because he was asked about it specifically. Now, we're supposed to trust these answers that are forthcoming at this time and are continuing to be revised. But initially and falsely, they claim that the, pra the practice of flagging conservative groups for additional scrutiny was contained to low-level staffers at a Cincinnati office. And first we heard it was a couple hundred or 75 and then 200, and now it's like 500. I mean, you know, how, how much do we trust someone that continues to change their story, and if it was low-level folks at the agency, how come the guy at the top just resigned? I mean, I understand that the buck stops there, but does the buck stop there, or should it stop there? And according to the report by the Inspector General, uh, they knew about the problem by June 2011. I mean, they knew about it. They're testifying in front of members of Congress, misleading members of Congress. Forget members of Congress. What about the American people? What about the people in these organizations, God-fearing, tax-paying Americans, that were targeted? What about them? According to the IG report, the IRS was not only targeting Tea Party organizations, it was going after groups focused on government spending, government debt, taxes, and education on ways to make America a better place to live. Really? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm being targeted because I'm looking through that list and I think those are things I stand for. I think that those are things that most of my constituents stand for. It also started targeting groups criticizing the government or educating Americans about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Since when? Since when is it a problem to criticize your government? I mean, isn't that one of the fundamental things that this nation was founded on? And now we're going to have the IRS come after us? And is it bad that we educate Americans about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? Is that a bad thing? Apparently, according to the IRS, it is. The use of the IRS to target political opponents of an administration is one of the greatest dangers of the tremendous power of this federal agency. I mean, I asked, are we living in a banana republic? Is this a tin horn dictatorship? Because certainly this can't happen in America. These are things that happen in these other small rogue nations where there are political dissidents that come to America 
to escape persecution. So, so what's next for us in America? If, if it starts here, does it end with then us going to jail as political dissenters against some uh, ideals that the administration currently in power has? I'm going to read an excerpt of the federal law, 26 U.S. Code 7217. It prohibits any employee of the executive office of the president and vice president, as well as cabinet secretaries, from requesting directly or indirectly that the IRS investigate any particular taxpayer with respect to the tax liability of such taxpayer. It is important that for the rule of law and the interest of justice that the Congress aggressively pursue its oversight function to get to the bottom of the scandal. We don't want to just get to the bottom of the scandal so we can make sure it never happens again. I mean, that's what we so often hear. We need to find out who instigated it and who authorized it because it is very hard for us to believe that these were just some low-level employees that, you know, that took it upon themselves. And I I must ask everybody, what is their impetus? What is their motivation to do that? Who, who would take it upon, what low-level employee would take it upon him or herself to say, well, we're going to start investigating Tea Party groups and, and, and groups with the name Patriot in their organization? What's in it for them? And I suspect you're having a hard time coming up with the answer just as I am. How long has this been going on? Well, apparently it started in February of 2010. And it lasted for about 27 months. The last appeal that was approved was in Champaign, Illinois, in February of 2010. So if you think back to February, what was happening in February of 2010? Well, first of all, if you own an iPad right now, you couldn't get one in February of 2010 because there were none available. It wasn't on the market. If you remember back then, there was a volcano over Iceland that was stopping air travel to Europe. There was the, the freshwater horizon that blew up in the Gulf, killing many workers and, and, and destroying the environment or contaminating the environment in the Gulf. That's how long ago this has happened. That's how long this, been, this has been going on. And that's how long people in this administration knew about it and said nothing. You know, I don't know what this means for Tea Party organizations and patriot groups and the like. I mean, if... If I quote Julian Bond, the former head of the NAACP, he calls the Tea Party the Taliban of American politics. The Taliban of American politics. I would suggest to you that they are exactly opposite that, and the actions of the administration are more keeping with the Taliban-like tactics. I mean, these folks are continually ridiculed for being, oh, opposed to government intrusion in their lives and, and worrying about conspiracies and what the government's, uh, what, what kind of personal things about them the government's looking into and what they're doing with it. And it's all very conspiratorial and, and uh, they're seen as kind of kooky whack jobs. Apparently, they're right. Who knew? During this same period of time, interestingly, a director in the IRS fast-tracked an application for the president's half-brother. Half that took one month. It took one month. Meanwhile, 27 months went by with organizations with the name Tea Party or Patriot couldn't receive the same consideration. And did frontline employees do this? I, again, I, I, I got to question that. It just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. And, and again, day by day, we hear more and more. I mean... The first thing that came out recently was that rogue employees did this. And at one point, only one employee. Really, one employee out of 106,000 that work at the IRS, that's what we're supposed to believe? Are we supposed to change our trust level and our belief level every day as new reports come out with new information that countervails the information of the day before? I mean, we've got to ask. Look, the government asks its citizens all kinds of information, whether you are a farmer and the agriculture department forces you to do a survey, complete a survey under penalty of law, and folks call up, they call up their congressman, they call me up in, their district, in the district office and they say, why must I fill this out? Why do they need all this information? What is this relevant information? That's one, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the ag department census. And maybe it's fair, maybe it's not. I take issue with it. But in this case, I really take issue with it. Because in this application and in their findings, the IRS findings, they looked at what books members were reading. What books? We're going to have a book burning next? 
They looked at Facebook posts, resumes of officers, minutes of meetings since the organization's inceptions. And I ask you, what does any of that have to do with your tax status? Or does it have to do with something else? Does it have to do with your political status? And who you may disagree with? 31 organizations' information was released to organizations like ProPublica. 31 organizations, and maybe that's the beginning of that, and maybe we, maybe we don't know the extent of how many other organizations were, were leaked this information, and what did they do with it? Did they maybe use it to target candidates in political elections to make sure that they lost because they disagreed with their ideology? Look, we understand that we oftentimes disagree on ideology, on policy, but we expect a fair and level playing field. And we certainly expect the government to provide that. That's the government's role. That's one of government's core missions. And in this case, obviously, the government was working for one team and decidedly against the other team. And what does that mean to all Americans? Some applications were under review at the IRS for three years. Yet you could sue the IRS after 270 days for inaction. For three, for three years, these things went dormant. So who's responsible? You know, we've had a host of scandals in this town for time immemorial. This administration is really at some point no different than the next, but on one point I think it has been so far. Nobody's ever responsible. People take responsibility, but there's no accountability, and no heads really roll. Nothing happens to anyone. The, finally, there's a firing here, and we're not sure this guy had anything to do with it, but I would ask you this. The president says that he finds out this information that you find out in the public on the same day you find it out. Mr. Speaker, that seems odd to me. He's the president. He's the leader of the country, and we know that he can't know every little thing in every agency. He can't know that, and we don't expect him to know that. that why, that's why he hires top people, smart people, to run those organizations for him. But he is the leader of the country, and when this is going on for a couple years and they know about it, Shouldn't we be, con be concerned that he doesn't know anything about it? I mean, is, isn't that, is that a failure of leadership? I think that's a great question. And I think, that, I think that it's bad that our president says that he doesn't know and that he truly doesn't know. I don't, think, I don't see that as a good thing. Mr. Speaker, the American public increasingly has a trust issue with this administration who's now in damage control. And we understand that they have to be. But, Mr. Speaker, while they're in damage control, is the people's business, the legitimate people's business, being conducted right now? Where is their focus? Where was their focus on these issues when they could have been stopped or averted? And where is it now? And what is the cost of that? And I would also say to you that this, as a person who has led organizations myself, at the top is where the culture starts. The person at the top, he or she, determines the culture of that whole organization. And the people within that organization survive or do not survive by going along and learning to fit in with that culture. And if everything below that starts eroding, you can only at some point look towards the top. And I would submit to you, under the current scenario of uh, the last week's events, that we might really be seeing the advent of the evidence of a culture of corruption that has been going on for more than just a few days. I mean, let's just go through a couple of them. I know you know it's coming, right? It started with Fast and Furious, and I can tell you that I don't feel like I've gotten the answers. I don't think the American people have gotten the answers that they've been looking for, and I certainly don't think that justice has been served for those folks, and particularly the one agent on the border who lost his life over that. And, of course, there's Benghazi, which information continues to come out even as we speak, including emails today that show that the State Department and the White House changed the intelligence talking points. Changed them? Why? Why change them? Why not tell the American people what happened, especially when apparently you know what happened? Is it because it shouldn't have happened and it didn't have to happen, because of, but there was no inaction when something could have changed? We heard that, well, we couldn't get folks there in time. Well, listen, we can do a lot of things in this town, but one thing I haven't seen anybody be able to do is, is to predict the future. And I don't know who in the White House or who in the Department of State predicted that the attack would only last so long. You know, years ago when I was a little kid, I watched hostages in Iran be taken. 
And that lasted for over, well over a year. 470 some days or something like that. Well, I mean, how did we know? How did the Department of State, how did the White House know that this wasn't going to be the same scenario and these folks weren't going to be held captive for years and years? And the, the United States held hostage. They just assumed whatever they assumed, I guess, or, you know, it's just interesting. We don't know the president's whereabouts during that period of time. I, I don't know if we'll ever know. But it's interesting that there's no culpability. There's no accountability. Folks at the, at the State Department, we were told, well, there, there were some low-level folks that, uh, that were responsible for the security uh, misfortune, missteps at the consulate, and they've been reassigned. Four people are dead. Families don't know why, they're, where their, chil why their children died. Their brothers, their sisters, their husbands, their fathers, they don't know for, to what end. And they still don't know. And if we left it up to this administration who keeps on stonewalling and just metering out the information as, only as fast as we can pull, them out, pull it out of them, they may never know. Is it embarrassing? Americans are forgiving. If a mistake was made, in good faith, a mistake was made. We're all human. But was a mistake made in good faith? Or was a mistake made, scratch that, was it a pre-calculated decision for political purposes? And if it was, that is indeed reprehensible. And I'm sure that is indeed embarrassing and there will be a cost to that. So maybe that's the motivation we don't know. And then there's the Justice Department wiretaps at the AP. The Attorney General recused himself. He recused himself. He recused himself of what? I'm not sure the timeline there. Does that mean he knew that, that the Justice Department was going to tap the AP, one of the largest wire services in, in, the, in the world? Did he know and say, well, there's an investigation going on, so I'm going to stay out of it, and he left it to his deputy? I mean, we don't know what to trust, but I can tell you this. According to the Department of Justice, their media subpoena requirement is the approval of the attorney general, which is required before a government attorney can issue a subpoena to a member of the news media. That's not my words. That comes right from... 28 CFR 50.10. 52 major media organizations have spoken out against this. This is, a, this is not a liberal, conservative thing. This is a freedom of the press. This is, this is an issue that crosses all lines. I mean, the Press Shield Act has been introduced in the Senate. It was introduced years ago, a couple years ago, when Democrats held the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Now it's being reintroduced and retouted. Well, really? If it was so important, if it's so important now, why didn't you pass it then? Why did you wait till now to reintroduce it and make a big deal of it? And I would suggest to you that that is more damage control. It's more political gamesmanship and trying to just make smooth over a bad situation. The Justice, De Justice Department wiretaps at the AP led right to this House gallery. And I wonder about jurisdic jurisdictional issues. Doesn't the executive office have a separation of powers duty? I mean, can the executive office wiretap the House of Representatives? And what about the Senate? Isn't it curious that the House of Representatives is controlled by the majority party, which is Republicans, so the wiretaps come here, but they don't go to the Senate, where arguably most of the reporters hang out because that's where things are really happening most of the day, but no wiretaps there. I guess it's just a coincidence, Mr. Speaker. Let's move on. Health and Human Services Secretary Sebelius out soliciting funds to pay for Obamacare. Is that appropriate? Or is that not a little scandalous? Uh, is she shaking them down? Is that the next, or we're we just now waiting for the next shoe to drop on that and to get some information about that? And there's another one waiting in the wings as we speak. The EPA, fees for FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, are normally waived for philanthropic and, and, and public policy oriented organizations. And of course, they were waived for 92% of green groups friendly with the EPA. Interestingly, during the same period of time, the fees were universally applied to conservative groups. Mr. Speaker, we have a trust issue. We've had a trust issue in the House of Representatives with the administration for some time. 
And the American people are starting to realize that they, too, have a trust issue. And it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate because at a time when Congress is, generally speaking, still at a pretty close to an all-time low of approval rating, what we need is uplifting things from the most transparent organization in history to make sure that the American people know that they can trust their government, even though they don't disagree even though they don't always agree, that sometimes they disagree with policy, but if it's out front, you give somebody your rationale, you tell them, this is why I think we should do what we should do. Citizen says, I don't agree, but you're our leader, so go ahead. But we don't lie to the American people. We don't hide things from the American people. We don't watch Americans die and do nothing about it and then lie about it after the fact. We don't mislead Congress. Mr. Speaker, it's a most critical time during these times for the administration to fully come clean on everything. Be upfront on everything. Don't parse the information. Because all that will serve to do is to erode the trust of the American people further day by day. Not only in the administration, not only in the administration, but in the halls of all the government institutions from the top to the bottom. And we as Americans are right to be cynical of our government. We are right to. And we have a right to be cynical. It's not a bad thing. It's a, we have the right to question. And we should question. That's how, answers, that's how answers come. But we shouldn't have to question the trust. trust. Questioning motives, questioning policies, those are apt things. But wondering why the government is collecting information to give to the IRS, why would you give it to the IRS? Why did the IRS need that information? Was it to get more taxes? Why do they need to know what books you're reading? The IRS can put people in jail, folks. Are we, are we looking towards a time when we put people in jail for reading the wrong books, for thinking the wrong things, for opposing the ruling powers? That is something for another world. That is something from another world, another country. This is America. These things do not happen here. These things should not happen here. Yet, Mr. Speaker, these things apparently and sadly have happened here. Mr. Speaker, it is time for the administration to lay everything on the table so that we know where we stand, so we can get past this and we can get back to the business of governance. We have slow economic growth. People are struggling. People have lost their jobs. People will continue to lose their jobs. Bills are going up. Paychecks are going down. That's what we need to be focusing on. We are held hostage by foreign governments who own our debt. We are held hostage by foreign governments who hold energy supplies while we're standing right on top of them in America. Those are the policies we need to be discussing, not whether our government misled us about Benghazi, whether they misled us about wiretaps, whether they misled us about fast and furious, whether they misled us about health and human services and, and what they're doing with shaking down companies for money for Obamacare and whether they're going to mislead us about the EPA and fees charged to certain organizations only and certainly the IRS targeting of certain individuals for what they think and what they say. There is no place in that in America, Mr. Speaker. We need to get to back to the people's business and we need to do it right fast. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the time and I yield back. Yields back. Does the gentleman have a motion? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow for morning hour debate. The House today swore in a new member, Mark Sanford of South Carolina. He's the former governor of that state and now takes the congressional seat left vacant by Tim Scott, who was appointed to the U.S. Senate. Representative Sanford served in that seat from 1995 to 2001 previously. The House returns Thursday for work on a bill sponsored by Minnesota Republican Michelle Bachman that calls for full repeal of the 2010 health care law. And later this week, debate on a measure requiring the SEC to conduct a cost-benefit analysis on new regulations while stating why those regulations are needed. Follow the House live here on C-SPAN when members return Thursday.
Jennifer Habercorn is health reporter with Politico. Why are House Republicans setting